Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today is show number 1753. Now, if you didn't listen to yesterday's show, go back and listen to it because it was part one of a two part special show I'm doing with my guest, David Smith, talking about what it's like to go to Ferrari and buy a vintage F1 car. So sit tight, buckle up. Here's the next part of the journey. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome back to Cars Yeah. Now, if you didn't listen to yesterday's show, as I said at the beginning, please go back and listen because you're going to hear the first part of the story. Now we're into the second part of the story as I sit here theoretically in Modena, Italy at the Ferrari factory with David Smith. Buongiorno, David. Welcome back to Cars Yeah. Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Absolutely. All right. Well, today David's going to share the second part of his journey, the process of buying a Formula One car, uh, what he went through to get it, to get in it, and then to drive it, and then to get it home. Let me give you, uh, again, a brief little uh, intro here about what we're talking about, and we're going to dive into the rest of the story. David Smith, back in 1993-94, decided he wanted to purchase and drive a vintage Formula One car, but not just any car. He wanted Gerhard Berger and John Alesi's 412T1B Ferrari F1 car, and he got it. Now, you remember from yesterday's show, he really just wanted to hang it on the window, but or hang it on the wall, but things got a lot further along than that. And when we left off yesterday, David had just stepped out of the car at Sears Point after doing some demonstration laps for a bunch of Ferrari owners, and he did a really good job. So now we're going to talk about what do you do now that you've got the car and you actually want to run it at tracks? Because Ferrari, they didn't really want you to do that, did they? Well, Ferrari uh, always, you know, their idea is that you buy the car, but you actually don't own it meaning that they're going to take care of it, they're going to do everything with it, and you get the pleasure of driving their car. And my idea was I bought it, so I'm going to run it and everything else. And they didn't really realize that that's what I do, and that's what my passion is, is making things work and run and so forth. And that was part of the big thing once I figured out I actually could drive the car, is taking care of it and running it and having fun with it and demonstrating the car. Uh, and so forth. So after I had run the car with the Giacomo helping me, uh, I wanted to talk to Clato about it because Clato had built up the car and so forth and so forth. So I asked Clato, I said, well, you know, how do I change the oil? No, 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 you know, you no, 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 you know, to change oil. No, no, no. I change oil. No, no, you do not change. So they don't even want you to change the oil. They don't want you to change oil. They don't want you to Where's the oil filter? No filter. No, I have filter. You know, I have filter, you know, and so forth. So the idea was to go ahead and de-engineer that car the best I could. So got the car into the trailer and Clayto helped me. And I'm sure he was feeling pretty bad because it went into my trailer, not their trailer, and brought the car home. And over the years, I'd met a good friend. His name is Chris Gannell, and very, very bright engineer and so forth. And he worked on a, on a couple IndyCar teams and so forth. And he was very, very good working with me. And I, I said, Chris, I really like to hire you and have you help me, and we can run the car together. And he said, Well, I think that's a great idea. So he came over and we started looking at it, taking it apart, doing this and that and everything else. And and I said, you know, what do you think about driving it to make it a little bit easier? So he came up with, well, let's uh, make it a little bit softer and so forth. So we softened up the suspension and we took things apart, put them back together very carefully and so forth. And we ended up doing a number of things that was very helpful to the car. And one was just getting rid of some of the air in the tires so we could get more footprint on the tire and they'd warm up quicker and so forth. And we weren't racing. So if the tires got a little bit warm. Well, great. That's what they did because they stick better. So with that, and I figured out really quickly by taking some things apart that there were some things that needed to be done to the car and I did those and so forth. And it ended up that the filter, because I talked about the oil filter, the filter was just an aircraft filter and I could buy one in a, in a filter shop for aircraft in Bellevue, Washington. <laughs> and it was 
$16. How many do you want? <laughs> oh, my and, God. Oh, my God. This is incredible. Yeah. And then I found out at the battery I could get that at Radio Shack. <laughs> and then I decided I needed spark plugs and so forth. So I had, for my racing days and so forth, I had a couple contacts still I knew at Champion Spark Plug. And they basically had retired. So I called back there and explained to them what I had because it had Champion Spark Plugs in it. And I had to make the tool to get them out. And I wanted another set and so forth. And so I get all the way through Champion and Champion said, oh, can't sell you spark plugs. I said, why? Because they're proprietary to Ferrari. Oh, ouch. Yeah. And so I went back to Ferrari, wrote the letters and everything else. And then all of a sudden, one day UPS came and I had four sets of spark plugs. <laughs> so Thank they you gave for- you spark plugs. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So anyway, we were able to run the car and uh, Chris and I built a number of things so we could just run it by ourselves. So this went on and I ran it around here, a couple tracks and uh, down at uh Oregon and so forth. And then we got an invitation to take the car down to California at a special Ferrari event. There would be some other F1s and some other things that, and it was on Rodeo Drive, show the car, and then they'd take and run it for the West Coast Ferrari Club. So we took the car down there and Chris came with me and because there was a couple other cars and so forth, some of the people from the Ferrari factory came over also for this event. Oh, uh, yeah. So we went and ran the car and everything else. And Ferrari, the people from the factory got pretty upset because we didn't ask them to run the car. Right. You did it yourself. Because we were running it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And so they were pretty put off with this whole thing. And their car, of course, didn't run and they had problems, everything else. I just ran four or five times, no problems, did everything else. I spun it once, but recovered and did everything else like that. So it ends up Giacomo comes over to me and he says, David, you you really, you know, upset the factory. You know, there's five guys here and what are you going to do? And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And he says, you're not supposed to do it. You're supposed to have them do it. I said, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's not a big deal. And so that was kind of like, OK, next time we do this, we're going to have the furry guys help us. Yeah. But that didn't quite happen. I'm going to take off now on another journey, and that would be going to a uh, going to the national meet in Atlanta. Okay. And this was the Ferrari Nationals. It happens once a year. It's a very big event, and this was a very nice one and an actually very well attended one because it was going to be at Road Atlanta and in a special hotel and all the rest of it. So I said, "Well, you know what? Let's take the Formula One." So. Chris says, I'll come. And so we get the car, get it there and everything else. And I said, well, you know what? We're here with a Formula One. Let's do everything. Let's concord the car. Let's put it through the demonstration. Let's do everything. I'll take and run it on the track. Let's do everything. Yeah. And, and never been done before with a modern Formula One. So we start out and uh, during the thing, everybody's looking and they asked me to do a demonstration just to take it apart and explain it. So Chris and I did a uh, basically a, a, a two hour talk in the afternoon and took the car partially apart and everything else and so forth. But the next day, and, and it was just a static thing. We just showed them this, this is what you do. And it was very well attended. And a lot of people said it was great. Yeah. So the next day during the Concord, you got to start your car and it's supposed to run. And in this particular thing, they wanted it to run and they wanted to run onto the field to show that you didn't have trailer queens. And I'm going like, geez, I got a Formula One. What? How do you drive a Formula One car on the grass? <laughs> yeah. So Chris looks at me and said, David, just drive it onto the grass. And I'm going, oh, OK, I'll just drive it on the grass. So everybody's getting their cars ready. And I think there was a little over 120 cars in the Concorde. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, there's this big wah. And <laughs> that's some Chris starting the car. Yep. I jump in the car in a shorts and T-shirt and everything else, and I drive the thing onto the grass of Formula <laughs> One. And it doesn't idle very well. No, 6,000 RPM. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it doesn't – in first gear, you're doing about 25 miles an hour doing nothing. So right. I'm just telling get everybody get out of the way because I'm going to do it. And I do it, and everybody goes – and I jump out of the car, and everybody goes, oh, my God, he actually did it. Yeah. Was that the first time a F1 Ferrari car had been on a Concorde field? I yes. mean, it, it driven on a Concorde field? Yes. First cool. time ever. Wow. It had been on, on the field and so forth. And – Anyway, so 
we do that, go through the concord, and at this time, it's really something. I mean, I'm just having a great time and so forth. We take the car apart somewhat and everything else, show everybody. And because this is a factory built car, how are the judges going to know anything? And the only thing I had done is I had upgraded the car a bunch because I had figured out some of the radio stuff and all that. So I had put some of the telemetry in it, and I'd found some stuff. I'd built some stuff. So the bottom line is it really looked really right off the track right. and so forth. So it was, you know, everybody was, wow, this is really good. And I'm enjoying that, but I'm also judging and doing some other things. And the afternoon, something happened and we were supposed to, I was supposed to be able to go ahead and get onto the track and do some, I was just going to take a rental car or somebody else's car and learn the driving of road Atlanta. Mm-hmm. It didn't work out that way at all. And I get there really late. And so they have two more sessions. And all they got is a, like a bus, a small bus. So I'm in there and going, oh, man, I'm going to have to drive tomorrow because I really want to do this. I don't know this track. So I'm kind of pushing myself to the front. And a couple of people say, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to drive the F1. <laughs> you are? You're going to drive the F1? And I said, yeah, I'm going to drive it at speed tomorrow. Okay, so I get to the front, and I live, and then I'm trying to remember everything about that track. And I, I, I had also gotten a couple in cars of the track. So I really, I was just kind of overreacting. I actually had pretty much the track in my head, but I'd never driven it. I had it in my head, but I'd never driven it. So the next day... We get to the track and so forth, and they've got it set up. You've got the little old cars. you got the slow cars and everything else. And then you've got the hot cars, which was then the uh, Ferrari cars are set up for the track and everything else. And there was a couple of the – can't remember the number on that. These are the, uh, like, IMSA cars they said set up by Ferrari. Oh, okay. And a couple of those, and then they had a couple of the – I think there was, you know, not three six and maybe a four thirty or something like that set up for track and everything like that. So they put us out all at once and so forth. And I thought, well, you know, for doing this because we're going to get three sessions, I'll just get in the back and so forth. So I just got in the back because I wanted to learn the track and and so forth. And we get the, the first session done, and a couple of guys come over and says, you know, uh, you know, your Formula One doesn't go very fast, does it? And I'm saying, no, it's. It's okay. I'm just kind of learning the track and all that. So the second session starts and so forth. I said, well, I got it down now, so I'll do it. And they had it set up so we could pass on the straightaways, but we weren't supposed to go wheel to wheel in the corner. So nobody crashed and smashed and all that. So that was good and all that. So I end up that I, you know, pretty soon I'm just blasting around the thing and I've got it down pretty well. So I've got a guy behind me and it's in one of the um, one of the big cars, the big Ferraris, and he has just decided that he's going to show me the way. And I hadn't really gone full out on a thing. So I said, OK, you know, so he's behind me and we're on the back straight away and on the back straight away, flat out. After on the third run, I could do 218 miles an hour with this thing. And it's got a digital readout so you could see what was going on. And by the time you're up there, it's going, the digits are going pretty slow so you could see it. And so I got it up to about 180 and he is right behind me, right behind me and so forth. And I'm saying, okay, just don't break, just don't break, just don't break, wait. Because I got carbon and carbon. Yeah, you've got those F1 brakes. <laughs> so I go into the corner, I wait, and when you break with this car, you basically come out of the seat and you hang on the belt. Yeah. So I slammed on the brakes, and this is before you do the big turn to the left and then a quick right and underneath the bridge and back down. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I see this car sideways, 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 and smoke going everywhere. Sure. And... It was just, okay, we aren't going to play with the Formula One anymore. No, (laughs) he's not going to outbreak that car. (laughs) It ended up on the third run, I got to do two, a couple laps just by myself. And at the end of the day, I was only, I don't remember how many seconds off the track record with the car. And I ran as hard as I could, as fast as I could. And it was one of those things, I'm either going to crash or going to do great. And it was one of those days, everything just worked. So 
I came out feeling absolutely great. The car ran perfect. And I was running as hard as I could with the car, which is meaning on, on the straightaways, I was flat on the floor with it. But in the corners, you know, you're probably 60, 70 percent of what the car can actually sure. do. Yeah. But there's very, very few cars that can beat a Formula One on a track. Yeah. No and kidding. that's the very <laughs> evident of how and weigh that one right and so forth. Yeah, so. yeah, how fun. Well, let's take a short break and thank our sponsors. We come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more with you about more things you did with the car and then finally saying arrivederci and deciding to let the car go because we'll find out, did it ever end up on a wall or what happened to this F1 car? So sit tight, we'll be right back. Hey, fellow inspiring automotive enthusiasts, did you know if you subscribe at carsyad.com, I'll send you my free filler up book, it's an ebook filled with fuel, filler fun, and inspirational quotes from past guests here on Cars Yeah. Plus, you'll get a weekly wrap up email from me every Friday, and your name will be in the hat for one of the many free giveaways here at Cars Yeah. Simply go to carsyeah.com and click on the free book button, and boom, you're in the club. And don't forget to subscribe to Cars Yeah on your mobile podcast app, and you'll get the Cars Yeah show delivered right to your mobile device every day, absolutely free. Inspiring automotive enthusiasts, that's what we're all about. Here at Cars Yeah. Thanks for listening. Here at Cars Yeah, it's all about inspiration. And our charity of choice is Tech Force Foundation, where it's all about making a positive difference in young people's lives. Tech Force helps young adults discover their talents and passions for all things automotive, with a mission of helping students develop a career as a professional technician. Tech Force awards nearly $2 million in scholarships every year. For students to pursue technical education and they support hands-on activities, events, and mentorships across the country, working to change the outdated perceptions of these careers. Auto techs are in high demand, but the supply of qualified technicians is critically short. They need your help to fuel their mission. Learn more and join me in supporting them at techforce.org. All right, we're back, David. So Talk us through the rest of your, before we get up to the point where you decided to either hang it on the wall or let the car go, more adventures you had with the car, maybe some of the other things you did with it. Did you continue to drive it? Did you ever get to do any kind of an actual race? Were they all demonstrations? And did you take it to other Concours events? Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, I just want to finish up one more thing is that the next day uh, at the at Atlanta, it was the final banquet and everything that was going on and so forth. And at that time, you don't know where everything has happened as far as the cars, the awards and all that. So because of, you know, the car and everything else like that, we get an award for the best Formula One because it was the only one there. <laughs> nice. And we get also an award for the best race car because it's got very good race history. Mm-hmm. And then we're sitting there and getting to the big awards and everything else like that. And we're sitting at the table with a group of friends and so forth. And they had done something because it was a a very large group of people there. And they're putting pictures up on a big screen showing the car and and people associated with the car as they're giving awards. And then they get it stops and it's a big thing because it's best to show and so forth. So all of a sudden, the best to show comes up and I'm talking with somebody and Jody hits me and she said, David, <laughs> Formula One's up there for best of show. Oh, my God. And, oh, somebody screwed up. They got the wrong slide. And I'm just talking away, and I'm not looking. And she said, no, 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 something's going on here. Hits me again. And I look up there, and all of a sudden, Ed Gilbertson calls up and says, David Smith, please come up. You are best of show. Wow. How cool is that? Only time in all of the uh, Ferrari Club of America or Ferrari Owner Club, a Formula One became best of show. Wow. Well, you know, this is a testament, David, to you because you you listeners that did not hear my talk with David a few months ago, go back and listen because uh, the prowess and expertise that David has for restoring cars is exemplary. He's taken cars to many best of shows. So the fact that this happened to you, I'm not really surprised because you know how to prep a car and obviously you know how to drive a car. Well, thank you, Mark. It was it was just one of those situations. I had no idea. I was shocked, but oh, I felt, you know, this is what I really want to do. I could be around my friends and show them something different. And it also let me show myself 
that I could actually drive and do what I always thought I could do. And I was around friends doing it. So it was that. And um, I, I showed the car a number of times. And part of having the car, I made a promise to my wife and also to myself, I would never go wheel to wheel with the car mm. because you can end up in a world of hurt with this car. Yeah. So I ran it a number of times, basically demonstrations and things like that, sometimes with other cars and sometimes with other Formula Ones and so forth, mostly Ferraris and so forth. So over the years, I did this and then we were invited to the year of Ferrari at uh, basically at uh, Pebble Beach, and part of what was happening is they said, we'd like to get a Formula One for each one of the decades and have them on the grass. So I worked with the factory, and uh, the factory said, yes, we can help you with this, and we will actually make an event out of it because it's a year of Ferrari. So I, uh, I was the person behind that, and we basically had a Formula One for each one of the decades, including a Michael Schumacher World Championship car. Wow. And so we had uh, seven cars, I believe, on the grass, but we also ran them on the track. Oh, yeah. I remember. I was there. It was awesome. It was a very, very good time and all that and so forth. So we had practice on Friday and we all ran and so forth. And the only thing that was a little bit uncomfortable is they ran us in practice in the morning. And in the morning, the cold, the track is cold. Yeah. And it also can be a little bit greasy depending on what's out ahead of you because the sun hasn't hit it. Yeah. So it's a real slippery hang on situation. And in practice... Again, go out there, run, don't do anything thing and so forth like that. So we came up with a pretty good program. And this time they had a number of people there and I had the Ferrari people actually work on the car. Chris was there, but didn't work on the car. I drove the car and it's basically set up, get in a car, go drive the car, get back out of the car and so forth. And they would put the cars out so that we weren't doing a lot of passing and so forth. So the fast cars were up front, the brand new cars, and I was towards the back of the field just because of the age of the car right. and a couple other cars behind me, and we'd do that and everything else. And what I didn't know is not everybody was out practicing and not everybody was uh, you know paying attention and doing things because I was doing my thing and all that. So on Saturday, we did the practice and everything like that, and then we're going to do a demonstration and for because that's when it's packed at Laguna Seca, and we're actually going to run pretty hard. We're going to do two warm-up laps, and then we got four laps to let it hang out and go do your thing and so forth. Don't smash anybody and don't get hung up with anybody, but go do it. So we're all set to do this and everything else. And I'm thinking everybody's going to be careful and all that. And they had uh, Bertoletti, who was a t uh, factory team driver. He was going to drive the F1 the Schumacher car. And he was really, really good and fast and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, you knew he was in. And this is one of those things. Look in your mirrors a lot and make sure you're doing the right thing. But the car I have is very, very fast because it got so much power. It's just tricky to drive because it doesn't have the driver aids right. and so forth. So we end up starting and we do one lap and come around and I'm coming back underneath the corner and do three corners and then underneath the bridge. And this guy passes me like, oh my God, what's going on? And it's one of the more it's one of the newer cars. And I think I look in the mirror and I think, God, that's Bertoloni. Everybody's going. And then all of a sudden, everybody's just going. So I stand on it and going and I'm going up the hill and I'm flat out going as fast as I can. OK, downshift, downshift, take a turn. And then you've got to take a left turn and you're going to go and you go flat for a little bit and up the up the hill to get to the corkscrew. Right. And I'm there, and I'm probably, oh, probably 120, 130 or something like that. And all of a sudden in front of me is all this dust and all this stuff, and I can see red parts and everything else, and it's like something's gone bad real fast. So I start downshifting, and I said, I'm only going to kill this thing, so I spun the car. I spun the car and I got it into neutral. Neutral is really important. And before you kill it, you got to get into neutral or, or the thing's in gear and it doesn't move. Right. So fortunately, I did it all in my head really, really quick. And as I'm spinning, I'm coming back around and I see this guy in a red suit and his legs 
are there. And I'm going, oh, God, I just miss him. And I'm still. That's the Ferrari car that's split in half, right? That's a car that's split in half. It hit the wall so hard that it broke the tub. His legs are hanging out. The engine goes one way. He goes another way. I'm the first one to the crash scene. Oh, no. Spinning in the mess. So I get out. I get out of the car as quickly as I can. And he's laying halfway out. His legs are in the track. Mm-hmm. And I help un, un, you know, strap him and everything else, and he's not moving. And I'm going, God, something's really bad. And I didn't think about it very carefully at the time, but I didn't hit him or anything else. Just this is like pure luck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people, wow. people are there, and everything else is happening. And you can hear over the loudspeaker. I didn't hear it because I still have my helmet on. But there's been a horrific crash up on the backside of the track and so forth. And all the other cars had come down and were back in the pits, except the car that was broken and myself. Yeah. Wow. And I'm sitting there and, you know, this is just working on on reactions and so forth. I didn't really get nervous about the whole thing until I started realizing what had happened. But I was so close to hitting somebody, smashing myself and maybe killing somebody in this car. Yeah. And my wife and my son were down in the pits and so forth. And I said to one of the guys up there that was coming, I said, you okay? And he was at a radio. I said, please call down there and say, I'm okay. Everything's okay. And make sure my wife yeah, knows. Yeah, make sure my, because she'll never let me get in the car again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He said, I'll take care of it. Well, he never did. So later on, as we're clearing up the track and so forth, and they basically take the, the broken pieces and everything. I'm still there. And they put it on a flatbed and they put a cover over the whole thing oh. because it's just a big old, it's a freaking mess. And there's goo all over everything and so forth. And I said, well, you know, I can get the car back. Just put a tow rope on the on the roll bar and get me up to the corkscrew, and then I can just because I'm in neutral, you can coast in or back down. So I jump in the car, yeah. and that's what I do. And I get down to the pits, and I can see all these people looking at me like I'm okay because they thought I was part of the crash. And I yeah. got friends there, and my wife's there, and Spencer's there, and I'm going like this is. Gonna, and that was the time we had a very very quick family discussion <laughs> yeah about the Your future said, you're done yeah i knew i was done too because there's no way i mean if i had hit him it could be like anything else it, it would have been it affected everybody for the rest of my life i'm yeah. just lucky i wasn't in hit him or crashed or something yeah. else yeah. and i knew at that time Every time I got into that car, I was nervous and it would take me a long time to get comfortable because it was so quick. Right. And as you get older, you get slower. And the car is something that's really, really difficult at times, but can be extremely rewarding because it's so exciting. Yeah. But this car was right behind Eric and Senna when he was killed. It's a car that can really hurt you. So I knew uh, the car had given me all these pleasures, everything I wanted out of a car, but it was going to go ahead and go to somebody else at that time. Yeah. Now, you know, that's an important fact. The day that uh, Senna was killed, yeah, the the next car on that corner that he went through and crashed was your car, right? It was exactly the car. And then afterwards, when they restarted the race, Gerhard Berger in that car, chassis 151, led the race. And then he finally was so upset and he was his problems and everything else. He parked the car and said it had a brake issue. It didn't have any brake issue. He just didn't want to drive anymore. And that was at Imola. And I have driven, excuse me, not driven. I have walked that track and it can be very fast and very scary and it's old and it's narrow. And yeah. it's, yeah, that, but this is Oof. the car. Yeah, that was the car. Wow. Well, so fortunate. I was at Laguna Seca that day when that accident happened, and uh, I knew the story beforehand, of course, but it's an amazing story. So fortunate that through that, you didn't hit that guy. I mean, I can't even imagine having driven that track and raced on that track, how easy it is at that point coming up that hill uh, if somebody's laying in the middle of the road to hit them. So thank goodness you had some experience and you were able to do that. Well, let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Your original intent was to buy a piece of wall sculpture, a Ferrari F1, and hang yeah. it on the wall. Now, you decided not to do that with the car. You decided to sell the car. So walk us kind of quickly through here 
when you decide to sell a car like this, which has a pretty narrow audience of buyers, what's the process? How did you do it? And were you happy at the end that you did let it go and you didn't hang it on the wall? Well, it's an interesting thing, Mark, because uh, uh, I tried it again with Ferrari and it was a 96 car. Uh, Same thing again, just at a different time, different place later. It was a 96 car and that was a a Schumacher uh, car. and Eddie Irvine car. And I drove that a couple times and then decided it was like driving a Lexus. And everybody says, a Lexus? And I said, yeah, it has all the driver aids. It's not, I mean, you could do all sorts of things. And it didn't want to spin. It didn't want to do anything crazy. It would just, you know, a car. Wow. And I ended up selling that one first because I didn't need to. And it was the same thing. I'm going to hang it on the wall. And then when we're all said and done, no, you're going to drive the car. Well, yeah. you don't need two cars. So I ended up selling that to a friend that said, oh, I got to have a Formula One. It's the best thing I ever had. And he had a lot of money and he drove the car. He never actually even drove the car. He started up and sat in the car and said, oh, my God, scared the crap out of me. So I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to do it. This is a bad idea. <laughs> it's in his garage. But this ended up that one of the people that was in when I did the demonstration in Atlanta said, if you ever want to sell this car, I'm a buyer. Mm. And I remembered that. So I called uh, him and he lives in Florida and he's got a very big collection of Ferraris and they're mostly modern cars and so forth and so forth. So I called him and I said, are you still interested in the car? And he said, absolutely. So he and his mechanic flew out and uh, we basically did a walkthrough a day and a half here with the car and he says, I'll take it and so forth. And it ended up that Charlie drove the car once and he said, I I can't do it. It's so scary and and it's so quick and I'm just going to hurt me in the car and everything else. But his son was driving the Porsche cup. So his son drove a couple of times and I saw them and I actually saw him drive and he did a very nice job with the car at Laguna Seca. And then they decided because of what was going on and the speed and everything else like that, that it's really kind of out of your control to do this. So yeah. I think most people that drive these cars, they do it for a shorter period of time than you would think, just because the cars take a lot, a lot of experience to do it you really need to be young you need to practice a lot and you can get over your head real real quick yeah. so yeah. most of the people that have these cars only have them for a period of time and so forth or they have them and they park them but they don't uh they don't use actually them. drive them there's another one up here that's been used a little bit but it was crashed twice and uh so forth so the owner said you know what we're gonna park the thing yeah yeah something can get hurt Uh, A reminder our listeners here, I'm going to put a link on David's show notes page here to uh, a website that is uh, Ferrari F1 Clienti. And it basically is, since 2003, uh, Ferrari set up their their F1 Clienti program. And it will offer enthusiasts who have deep enough pockets to buy a Formula One car. You go to the factory. Now, the program is different than when David started. When you get there, the car is actually there. And uh, it's not just a tub and they go, I come back a few times. But it's a program that if you uh, are well healed enough, as they say, that you can go, you can buy a car that was actually raced. Uh, They'll help you with it. They'll take you to a I got to do the program in 2011, uh, spend a couple days there, go to the track. Uh, they fit you to the car, put the whole thing together. So I'll put a link to that. So the car ended up going away. And, you know, David, I'm really, really grateful that you did this with me today. Very different kind of cars, yeah, show. But uh, I know in our break series, you said this is bringing back a lot of very special memories for you, right? Oh, it is. It's it's going down memory lane. And I've always said to people, my life is as chapters. This is a very special chapter for me because I thought I'd never be able to do it my whole life. I got to do it. I got to do it in a very big way. And when I set out for this, you know, to do it, what I didn't realize is I'm actually going to drive it and to drive the car and have it and be part of this. And I took care of it. And Chris helped me. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that most people would dream about. I got to do the dream. Yeah. And I really did. And I'll say this to anybody. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I've fortunately done a lot of exciting things. So this is at the top. And to have a piece of equipment that was so special and specially built to do one thing, go real fast and be really competitive, 
it was just special. And and on top of that, it was a Ferrari. And it doesn't get any better than that. Absolutely. It just absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, David, this has been so much fun. And I, again, I really can't thank you enough as a longtime friend to take the time to do this and to share something different and unique with Cars Yeah listeners. If you're a regular listener here, you know, uh, shoot me an email and let me know if you like this kind of thing. Maybe we'll do more of this in the future here on Cars Yeah uh, to take you on a journey that most of us will never get to do and get the insiders part of it. And David broke some ground here and probably opened some eyes at Ferrari saying, oh, we could have, we could scale our business here with this Clanty. F1 program, and that's exactly what they've done. David, hey, thank you for taking us all on a really fun ride today. This has been absolutely awesome. It's been so much fun. Uh, until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you down the road or maybe at the at the racetrack. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again, Mark. It's been a pleasure. And you saw the car and around the car, and you appreciate it so much. So, so happy to do this with you, and thank you again. You're welcome. This has been awesome. Did you know that Cars Yeah! is in the top 1% of all podcasts based on listenership, according to Libsyn, the premier RSS feed for podcasts in the United States? That's right. And Cars Yeah! is the only five-day-a-week automotive-focused podcast for you to get your message into the ears of thousands of listeners daily from all over the world. Plus, DuPont Registry recommended Cars Yeah! is one of their top 10 car podcasts for you to enjoy. Cars yeah has experienced tremendous growth, plus your ads are evergreen, meaning they never go away. And more and more listeners find Cars yeah every day for their daily dose of automotive inspiration. Do you want to expose your brand to a highly targeted list of automotive enthusiasts in a very unique and very personal way? Well, I can help you. Contact me, Mark Green, at mark at carsyeah.com or through the website at carsyeah.com today to learn more. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah. Yeah.